this talk is going to be focused on the monastic origins of the, of the Maronite liturgy. Um, you know, they say in hindsight, uh, you know, vision is twenty twenty, and thinking about it now, I probably sort of started this series of talks I've been giving with this talk, since this is going to be a blend of sort of historical and spiritual uh, significance. So we can take this sort of as a prequel, you know, as they do in the, in the you know, when they do movie series, this could be a prequel to all the talks we've been given, sort of an origins of the spirituality and sort of the, uh, the, the Maronite structure of the church and the monastic influences both on the liturgy and the structure itself. Uh, now to start, you know, as we all know, it's impossible, especially in the Syriac tradition, not only it's unique, it's not only unique to the Maronite tradition, but in the Syriac tradition in general, it's impossible to separate the ascetic or hermetic or monastic influences from the general church itself and the formation of these churches. And what's unique about the Maronite church is that the Maronite church is formed purely you know, from monastic influences and from monastic origins. And to fully understand this, we have to take a historical approach, uh, sort of understanding the way that ascetic life emerged and the influence it had on the church hierarchy and the church identity and the identity of the people itself. Uh, the Maronite church is intrinsically monastic, so we can't remove the monastic orders, we can't remove the monastic nature of the church without actually sort of damaging the identity of the church. And her liturgy and the spirituality of this liturgy can only be understood through a monastic lens or sort of a monastic uh, light. So this church, so to speak, the, the, uh, the Maronite tradition, we could say arguably it was developed by ascetics. So when I say ascetics, I mean... Uh, Monastics and hermits. So monks and hermits, we call, you know, they can be called generally ascetics. So we can say that this tradition was developed by ascetics, for ascetics. You know, the liturgical practices uh, that were maintained specifically in the holy, in the holy value. So we have Anubin, Kodisha, and Ashaya, in those general areas of Lebanon. Um, you know, the liturgical practices there were maintained in a way throughout the centuries and millennia, so that all these ascetics, all these monks, all these hermits, would conform themselves both physically and spiritually into the image of God. We say in Syria, um, so awake and do not sleep. So that's the typology of the angels. So the monks would conform themselves through their prayers and practice of liturgy to so they'd become themselves images of angels, perpetually in praise, perpetually in glorification of, of God, and perpetually in the presence of God. So this act in of itself was an act of sanctifying the valley. That's why we call it the Holy Valley. Kodisha. Kodisha. I mean, means holy. That's why we call it the Holy Valley itself. So, these, these, these liturgical acts, the spirituality of the monks, of being so of being awake, um, without any sleep, of being watchers, you know, yakaza, of being watchers in the night, of being this, this, this image of angels in the presence of God, sanctified not only the valley, but the people themselves, the people who took part in sort of monastic practices themselves. Uh, now to start, we have to have, you know, we have to go back to the origins, so to speak. And the origins, obviously, are St. Maroon. So St. Maroon was, he's, 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 he's a pioneer in the Syriac tradition of ascetic life. Um, he took this, uh, this Syriac tradition, Syriac and Turkic tradition, and transformed it into this extremely simple, yeah, symbolically and theologically rich expression of the faith that was that was growing and developing and that was that was already sort of grounded in Antioch. Now what's important is the Maronite Church is the only church that takes its name from a person, Saint Maroon. And as such being a monk, that sort of starts to, you know, um, focus our view on the monastic origin, on sort of the monastic importance that this church was founded upon. So the only way that the only way the Maronite Church could actually develop and grow was through a unique hierarchical structure that emerged, you know, due to schisms and due to heresies. So with the emergence of the Jacobite Church, so when Antioch fell into heresy, when the seat of Antioch fell into heresy, the emergence of the Jacobite churches or the non Chalcedonian churches. Uh, this forced the Maronites of all of the monks, so they were not called Maronites back then, of the, the monks of that model the monastery of St. Maroon in Afamia to come together 
as they themselves are still Chalcedonian and elect a patriarch. So this is where we have you know, the controversial figure of um, St. John Maroon being elected patriarch. It was the spirit of the monster who was elected patriarch. So now we have the emergence of a monk who is a patriarch. He himself then elevated a number of his brother monks to the ranks of bishops. So now we have a church hierarchy entirely formed in a monastic environment, entirely formed by monks and ascetics, uh, formed in monastic tradition that caters and serves a monastic community. So once again, we're starting to see the roots of the church itself, the roots of the hierarchy itself, the roots of the ecclesiastical structure itself is intrinsically monastic. Now, the oldest the oldest records of this, you know, it, it's arguable. It's, you know, I say controversial because there's controversy about the existence of St. John Maroon. But the, the oldest records of this election happening in Afamia, so in Bad Maroon, in the monastery of St. Maroon, go back to roughly 740 AD, plus or minus a couple, you know, plus or minus a couple of years, roughly 740 AD, where the, the Jacobite patriarch, Dionysius al um, al that emerged in, in, in South, South Turkey, and Syria areas, so in the Antioch area, in the Afamia area, the monks of Bad Marun have to flee, as we obviously know. We have, you know, the, the feast of the 350 martyrs. That's what we commemorate here when the monks were sort of you know, butchered and massacred. That's what we commemorate the feast of the 350 um, um, monk martyrs. So they fled to Lebanon, and they found refuge and solace in the Holy Valleys, so in Gaudisha and Nubin, and as Hayya, in these... In these uh, of the mountainous valleys of Lebanon where sort of the, the opposition couldn't get to them. So that's where we have the first, you know, a Maronite monasticism, so to speak, start to flourish due to the fact that, you know, in order for anything to flourish, you have to have safety and peace. And they found this safety and peace from persecution in these mountains, and we start to see the spread of monasticism in these mountains. So whoever goes to Lebanon, visits these valleys, sees the, the, the wealth of monastic cells, of ruined monasteries, of hermitages, dotted across the mountains and caves. So this is the emergence of the Maronite identity, the emergence of Maronite spirituality, the emergence of Maronite monasticism. And what's unique about these, these monks that fled, um, Afamia, that fled South, South Turkey and, and Syria and found refuge in Lebanon, is that they, they didn't only form a religious community, but the locals, you know, the locals of those areas fled with them. So we have now an intertwined community of laity, of priests, of monks, of hermits, of bishops and patriarchs. Now what's interesting is this, this, this intertwined community formed not a cultural or national identity, but an ethno-religious identity, an ethnicity, you know, an ethnicity formed not only on, on you know, genetics, but ethnicity also formed on religious affiliation tradition, culture, and practices. So this is the emergence now. So in these valleys, we have the emergence of the Maronite identity as an ethno-religious identity. And what's interesting is, early on in the church, there was, um, I'd call it civil authority. There wasn't civil authority, so to speak. We had we had what's known as a theocracy. Now, it's similar, so to speak, of, of the papal state in Rome, you know, where the, patri- where the Pope himself had authority of, over all the papal states. Patriarch in Lebanon, or in the northern areas of Lebanon, in the valley, is reigned supreme. So he was the, the supreme authority of all laity, of all bishops, of all hermits, or monks, or priests. So we have the emergence now of this Maronite um, ethno religious identity, which at the same time was a theocracy where the patriarch himself reigned supreme. Religious and civil matters were, were led by the patriarch, with representatives, you know, forming feudal systems, so a feudal lord system where the, the laity would have certain princes or lords in Arabic known as a sheikh, so a sheikh who would run sort of the lands and, and be in charge of the lands, yet he'd be a subordinate and under, under obedience to the patriarch himself. Um, there are three major changes that happened over the, over the centuries, three major changes that happened to the church over the centuries that influenced and directed the entire sort of trajectory of the Maronite history, Maronite cultural identity, and sort of, we can say, they directed the development of Lebanon as we know it. Now, the first thing that happened was, 
1584, we have the formation of the Maronite College in Rome. So this was the first time a seminary emerged. This was the first time an actual viable school for priests emerged. Because initially there were no schools for priests. There was only monastic formation. And the priests would be under certain hermits, or spiritual fathers as, as they were known. And they'd learned from them before being elevated to the priestly offices. Now this formation of the Maronite College men, we have now young students, young seminarians who are sent to Rome to study Roman ways, and now are sent back to Lebanon. And instead of having the traditional, we call it in Arabic, the Madrasa de Sindiene, so the school under the tree, the school of the tree, you know, where the monks would teach the students, the village, the village students, or the village children, you know, under the shade of the trees, would teach them our ways, would teach them culture, would teach them history, would teach them religion, spirituality. Now we have these seminarians returning as priests from Rome, ordained in Rome, with Western views and ideas, slowly, you know, developing colleges and actual schools in Lebanon to sort of um, promulgate these Western views and ideas in the Maronite society, in the Maronite identity. So now we start seeing this Maronite identity slowly from the, you know, from the 16th century, slowly starting to conform itself to this Western um, development, to these Western influences. Now, the second major thing that happened was in 1695, we have four young men from Halab who came to Patriarch Adwehi and proposed to him the formation of um, a structured monastic life. Now, these four young men, uh, these four young men, with permission of, of Patriarch Dweyhe, had their first male monastery in uh, Mot -Mot 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 Mot it's up in the north. And from there, they sort of spread into the valley, you know, as Hayyab and Mubin, and throughout all of Lebanon. And this monastic order that first emerged, now is split into two groups, the Baladites, or the Lebanese Maronite order, and the Halabiyya, or the, the Alapites, or what we know today as Mariami. So in, in 1695, we have the emergence, the first emergence of a structured monastic order, a structured monastic community that has a set rule, a set constitution, with a set hierarchy, and a set central superior general. And at the same time, we have the third group that emerged, called the Antonii, roughly within 10 or 15 years of each other. The Antonii, or the Antonine order, emerged. And this is the first time these three groups emerged in Syriac monasticism, in the Syriac churches, and in the... In, in, yeah, in the Syriac churches, so to speak, Antiochian churches, that monasticism was developed in a structured, um, constitutional manner under one hierarchy. Now, what, what was the norm back then? What was the norm back then is that each monastery was um, independent, so to speak, each superior was independent, yet there weren't any orders, but each person would be an ascetic, a hermit, or a monk in a monastic church. So the church itself was monastic, so there was no need for monastic orders to be formed, since the patriarch himself would have been a monk, since every all monasteries then would be under the authority of the patriarch, the authority of a monastic church. But in 1695, we start to see, as I said, separate orders under separate constitutions forming, sort of uh, structuring his monastic way of life into a centralized body. And the final thing that occurred, historically speaking, that sort of put the Maronite church and Maronite identity on this trajectory that we're on now is in 1730, uh, 1736 roughly, we could say, was the Synod of Mount Lebanon. Now we talk about, you know, we talk about all these ecumenical councils and all the councils in Rome. This is equivalent for the Maronites, the Synod of Mount Lebanon, basically restructured the entire church, ecclesiastically, spiritually, politically, religiously, hierarchically, you structure the entire church. And the most profound decision that came out of it was the splitting of the patriarch lands. So prior to 1736, the patriarch had complete authority over the entire the entirety of Lebanon, the entirety of Lebanon, and he'd, and he'd elevate separate monks, different monks, to bishops as he as he pleased. So there was an unlimited amount of bishops, so to speak, he could elevate as assistant bishops. So no bishop would have his own diocese or eparchy, and they would all be assistants to the patriarch. So once again, there was this monastic, sort of structure to the church where the patriarch is superior and he'd have assistance that help him govern. Yet after 1736, there was a split of the patriarch lands with separate eparchies, separate dioceses. Um, each diocese had its own bishop. So now we now we form, instead of this monastic 
a way of ruling monastic image of the patriarch or the patriarchal church. Now we have a concilia, so a synod of bishops, so to speak, that rules the church with the patriarch as the head. So we can see slowly, slowly, beginning in 15, um, 1584, with the emergence of the Maronite College, 1736, we can see a gradual sort of cementing of a Western way, a Western structure, a Western hierarchy in the Syriac, in, in the Maronite Church. So we start to see now a development, sadly, away from the monastic origins into a diocesan um, influence, into a diocesan structure. Now, I'm not saying these are bad things, no, because by doing that, there were positive things that emerged, or a lot of good things that emerged, hierarchy speaking, in the way that the church is governed, in the way, uh, um, you know, the way the, the, the lives of the people, the lives of, you know, of the monks, the priests. So the, the way the church is governed, it, it was pretty good for that, but at the same time, there were certain traditions, there were certain uh, aspects of monasticism, there were certain aspects of spirituality that were lost, which is not yet, which is quite sad, but that can't be changed. Whenever there's change, there's always something that's lost. So, there are the three major things now, there are the three major events that occurred that sort of put the Maronite Church on, on this trajectory that we have now. So, the way sort of the monastic influences. But having that in mind, we have to understand that it wasn't up until. Uh, 1584, so to speak, roughly 1584, that there was an actual seminary. So for the millennia before that, so we can say since 600, so since the 7th century, you know, the emergence of, of Bat Maroon in the Famia and the, and the hierarchy in the Famia, till the 1500s or 1600s, the entire um, formation of the church hierarchy was a monastic formation. Now, how would this work? You know, in order to have a monastic formation, there has to be a community. Yeah, the community were loosely structured around separate monasteries. And these monasteries weren't the monasteries we know today, like I said, they weren't structured that, that came in six that came in the late sixteen hundreds, the structure. They were across, you know, different cells and hermitages. But what's unique about Syriac um, hermetic and ascetic life is that a hermit can never live alone. Because monasticism is community, and a hermit would always live in a community. He would be a spiritual father, so to speak, and he'd have students with him. So we see up with St. Charles, St. Charles, even though he's a hermit, he had two brothers, two younger monks that would tend to him and live with him in the hermit, in the hermitage. So Maronite ascetic life was never a solitary, completely solitary life. It was one based on community. And it's in this communal life that all formation, all religious formation occurred. So instead of like today, we have seminarians that go, you know, seminarians are sent to all people. You know, or men who want, who want to join or, um, you know, religious life or, or the priests who want to be sent to a seminary or certain monastic formation houses. Previously in our history, they joined hermitages. So these young men would go live with a hermit for a number of years and they trained under his guidance as a spiritual father. He trained them as a spiritual father, so things he learned from his spiritual fathers will be passed on to them. So we see now a tradition of... Um, Passing on these ideas, passing on these beliefs, passing on this spirituality based on what was given, based on the forefathers. So this links us back to Bad Marun in Afamia. This links us back to the formation of the Maronite Church where, you know, traditions were kept by this constant passing on from spiritual father to spiritual child, spiritual father to spiritual child. This is persistent, this, this consistent tra um, transmission of the faith, this consistent transmission of the practice of the faith was one on you know, monastic fatherhood, monastic spirituality in communal life. Not as we know today in, in you know, seminary life or diocesan life. No, no, the Maronite Church was trans uh, transmitted its spirituality, its religious teachings and beliefs through purely monastic communal life. What's also unique is that up until the emergence of the Maronite, of the Maronite College, so up until 15, 1584, so to speak, all patriarchs and all bishops were elected from hermitages. So up until then, every patriarch and bishop was arguably a hermit or a ascetic. So once again, we start to see, you know, the, the monastic origins of the church hierarchy itself. That, um, you know, it, it wasn't conceived the idea that 
anyone besides a monk can lead. Once again, the monasticism is communal life, and the church itself was a communal life. Like I said, the identity is interwoven between laity and, and the religious. So it's only fitting that the patriarch himself would come from, come from a communal life, come from monasticism, in order to ensure this interwoven nature of, of community is maintained. Uh, by saying this, we have to understand that all priests, we, we, we differentiate here between Khure and Rahim. So, you know, diocesan priests or secular priests and monastic priests. Like all Eastern churches, up until 1584, that is, like all Eastern churches, any celibate priest would have joined the monastery, whereas any secular priest would have been married. There was no idea of a priest serving as parish in a village who is celibate. So all priests were either monks that are celibate or secular that are married. Now this meant, once again, this meant that the hierarchy of the church itself could only be taken from monastic ranks as uh, a married priest can't you know, be elevated in the hierarchy of the church. And at the same time, like the church itself is hierarchical, like the patriarch is in charge of the community, the, Man the, the Maronite families themselves became small churches. You know? Most Maronite families had priests within them married priests with children. You'd find, you'd rarely find a family that, that didn't have a uh, you know, married priest within it. So the families themselves and this interwoven identity, this interwoven spirituality of, of mimicking the church hierarchy, the church um, spirituality, the church structure within the, the church itself, within the house itself. So the houses, these men, these, these, you know, the houses of the laity, the houses of the people, the Maronites became mini churches, became small churches where everyone themselves can partake sort of in this spirituality, everyone, can, everyone themselves can partake in this, um, in the formation itself, in the, in the religious formation that these priests would get from the, the monks. That's why there's, you know, it, it's unique to, to the Lebanese where uh, if, you go, if you go to Lebanon, even here it happens here, they say our monks. When we talk about the monks, no matter what they are, the people, the Maronite people always say our monks. So it's this interwoven identity of, of you know, relating constantly relating, you know, throughout all the ages, relating to monasticism, relating to this monastic identity that's, that's essential, that's quintessential to, you know, the Maronite life. Um, moving on now in time, so 1584 was the first, uh, the first seminary in, in Rome, 1584. We have the first seminary to open in, in, in Lebanon in, uh, say, the Paola, Our Lady of Hawa in the north. That's near, that's near as high up uh, the area over there. That was in 1624, but that lasted roughly um, nine years, which was closed due to persecution of wars. So, once again, we have this split of, of diocesan, of seminarian studies, of, of a split from monastic studies that returned once again to monastic studies. So there was this constant return to monastic studies, constant return to monastic formation. Every time diocesan or every time secular formation couldn't really meet the needs of the church. Now it's important because in this period, the ascetic life was at its peak. So in the 1600s, the ascetic life was at, at, its, at its peak. And inevitably, the patriarch and the bishops themselves couldn't be split from the Maronite church, you know, the ascetic Maronite church. That meant all formation um, was monastic. All formation being monastic meant all scholarly work was monastic, all administrative work was monastic, all historic work was monastic. Now the focus here is on the scholarly work. So we have the first 1600 years of the church being monastic. That means all the manuscripts themselves, all the prayers themselves, all the books themselves, all the church constitutions, all the rules, so everything associated by the church is inevitably, inevitably written by monks. Since the monks were the only ones that would be learned enough, that would be educated enough to write, they were the scribes, so to speak, and they were the writers of manuscripts and they were the transcribers. So now we have this understanding, the monastic origin of the church, uh, this ethno-religious identity. The patriarch reigned supreme as a theocracy, patriarch lands, all bishops being monks, the patriarch himself being a monk, or formation of priests and monks alike, being in the cells of hermits, so being by hermits, and all, all written texts spread in the Maronite church coming from monastic origins. 
Now this is this is important because the first printing press, or arguably we can claim the first printing press in the Middle East, the first printing press in the, in the Middle East uh, was brought over by um, Patriarch Yosef Rizze and his brothers, who were all hermits in Ashaya. And if you go to if you go to Matif, if you go to the, the museum of Ashaya, you can see this first printing press. So now we start to have this promulgation of ideas, so the spreading of ideas, so to speak, um, is propaganda. Well, propaganda emerging in monastic sense. So now all texts, or books, or Bibles, or translations, or Psalms, or the office, the books of the office, now they're, they're produced by, by monks. So now we come to a point where it's inevitable that the monastic, or that the, the Marama identity is separated from the monastic identity since all aspects of its hierarchy, since all aspects of its authority, and since all aspects of basically its administration were focused on monastic life and the ability of the monks to produce texts in order for these ideas to be, you know, to be kept, to be saved, and to be spread around the patriarchal lands. Um, so that's the first. That's basically the historical uh, view. That's the historical view. If there's any questions, we'll just stop for any questions around this historical view for a couple of minutes now. If anyone has any questions on what I've just spoken about. Hi, brother. I have a question, if that's okay. Yep, yep. Just uh, from a historical point of view, uh, I think I've asked this question before in a talk, um, but I can't remember, to be honest, the answer. If we go back to the Council of Chalcedon, yes. we've got the Jacobite Church who, is, who doesn't subscribe to the Council, and then you've got the monks of uh, Yes. So then they appoint their own patriarch. Now, if you look at the look at the patriarchs now in Antioch, you got five, right? Syriac Catholic, Syriac Orthodox, Maronite, Melkite, and Antiochian Orthodox. Yes. Now, so the Melkites and the, and the Antiochian Orthodox, they come from the same patriarch or same church, kind of. They were Chalcedonian. Why didn't we just, why was there a bishop there? Why didn't, why didn't we just have right. a bishop that was already there? So the Antiochian Orthodox um, originate, they're called Melkite, you know, or Mel Melkite, yeah, comes from the word Malik. So they are the men of the king, they were the men of the emperor. So their origins are Constantinople, from Constantinople, but uh, in the Syriac part of Constantinople, so to speak. That's why they're Byzantinian, and they don't adhere to the Syriac tradition, because their, their origins, their tradition is from Constantinople. Yeah, so, so were they like not in Syria, uh, were they not in Antioch at the time? Um, they would have been spread around Antioch, because Antioch was part of the, the empire, the Byzantinian Empire at a time. Yeah, it's a different um, liturgical tradition. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, no, I, was the, the, I was under the impression that they used to practice Syriac traditions, and then after the, like, after the first thousand years or something, somewhere they changed to Byzantine tradition. So, early on, early on, all the churches in Syria, in, the, in Antioch, in the general area of Antioch, would have been Antiochian, in the Antiochian tradition. Yet yeah, after Chalcedon, and then Antioch fell to um, to heresy. The patriarchal see of Antioch fell to heresy. Um, and being called, you know, the king's men, Melchites, you know, the Malik, the emperor, they, they slowly started to adhere to this Byzantinization. You know, we always hear about Latinization, but they would have undertaken a Byzantinization adhering to, you know, the, the um, liturgical form or structure of Constantinople. Being, you know, having this close influence and protection of, of the empire, but as I said, you know, as you as you said, and as I've said, the origin is a Syriac origin, since they were in Antiochian lands. Yeah, their links and close ties and protection given by the emperor, and then over time they were Byzantinized and took up, you know, the Greek liturgy and the liturgy of Constantinople, and they emerged as Minoa today. And but just just on what you've said, all the all the separate seas, all the separate patriarchal seas. You know, that they claim to Antioch, you know, they all have, they were all united up until the schisms occurred after, after Chalcedon and Ephesus, all the schisms, they were all united as, as one patriarchy. Yet yeah, once that fell into, into schism, it was only, it was only, you know, um, normal, it was only, it was, it was inevitable to see that pro-Chalcedonians and non-Chalcedonians would lay claim to the patriarchy, because it was never split, you know, initially it was just one patriarchy see that ruled Antioch as a whole. But it was that schism that occurred that caused sort of the fractioning of the church, the fracturing of the church. And over the years, 
you know, you have all the Orthodox, Antiochian Orthodox, the Syriac Jacobites, and, and all the other Antiochian Orthodox that lay claim to, to Antioch. Yet over the years, once they were in union, brought back in union with Rome, once they became union gate, Rome gave them the right to elevate their bishops to, to the patriarchy of, of Antioch for that certain right as well. But we can argue, we can argue out of all these churches, you know, between the, well, the two oldest that can lay claim to Chalcedon, based on based on what we have, based on you know the, the manuscripts and, and historical data that we have, the two oldest can be the, the Jacobites, the Syriac Orthodox themselves, and the uh, the monks of Ephemia. So they're the two oldest that can lay claim to um, the see of Chalcedon in an Antiochian sense, not a Byzantinian Byzantinian sense, in an, in a purely Syriac Antiochian sense. Chat. Yep. Uh, so, any more questions based based on this historical sort of this historical yeah, present? I was just thank thank you for the talk so far. I was just going to ask a quick one um, relating to what you just answered. I forgot which lecture I was listening to, but it was something related to this topic. I'll just tell you what I heard, and I don't know if it needs to be fact checked or what. But it was like this: there was a patriarch called Patriarch Athanasius or Anastasius or something like that. Sorry, just fixing this. Um, and so that was around 6, 70, 80, so 50, around that time. Anyway, there was the Byzantinians were warring with the Sassanids or somebody around that time. And then that patriarch fled from Antioch to Constantinople for safety. Um, so in other words, Antioch didn't have one, a patriarch. Then he came back briefly, then, because when the Byzantines recaptured Antioch, and then Antioch fell again to the Sassanids militarily. So the patriarch went back to Constantinople. There was some sort of rebellion there where that patriarch was killed. Then for a brief period of time, Constantinople would appoint titular, like nominal or symbolic patriarchs of Antioch who were never actually able to reside in Antioch. Then the Maronites kept requesting a patriarch over Antioch until eventually, so according to this, Constantinople said to them, you elect the patriarch from among your bishops. This is what the story goes. I haven't been able to find the primary resources for it. So that's when they did that. Okay, so the, the person who narrated this history, Yumiya, continued on to say that as a, as a follow-up, um, we have obviously the Third Rome, so-called the Russians claimed themselves to be the Third Rome after the Second Rome of Byzantium. When they celebrated the 1,000-year anniversary of the Christianization of Russia, which was the year 1,900 or 800 and something, they invited all the patriarchs, so etc. They invited the patriarch of Byzantium, whatever. But the only patriarch of Antioch that they invited from among the five was the Maronite patriarch. It was, I think it was Nasrallah Spade or something like that. And that was like them affirming that that's the only patriarch of Antioch that they recognized. Anyway, this is a narrative that I heard once in a lecture um, by this gangster old man. But I'm just putting that out there for you to sort of... You know, I don't think... Um Byzantinian subordination would sit well with many Maronite bishops today, so that's a big question of up until we can get proper sources, you know, historical sources. Mm. Okay. Because like I said, the only written source, the oldest written source about um, Johanna Marun, John Marun, being elected came from the Jacobites, it came from the opposing patriarch. So there was a, there was an opposition of patriarchs there, so there was a patriarchal see there, but non-Chalcedonian. And for... It's, it's, you know, for the Byzantinians to allow the Syriac Antiochian to claim, um, to claim Antioch and not place one of their people there. It's a bit, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, politically, because we have to understand, you know, Byzantinian Empire was more polit politically inclined in their, in their, yeah. you know, in, in nominating bishops and patriarchs and it was spiritually inclined. So it's a bit... Evenly, I found sort of uh, the reason why I'm not fully bulletproof on that narrative is because when you keep reading, you do see Byzantinian persecution of the Maronites. Yeah. So I was a bit uncertain of how could maybe the church hierarchy ask them to put in a patriarch or this and that. Okay. Okay. But then, yeah. All right. So if there are no more, if there are no more questions, we'll continue in the second part, which we sort of enter more into the, the spiritual formation of of the monastic liturgy. So, any more questions? Alright, so we'll continue now. Um, 
there's something called that merges in the, the Maronite church, is something called the lived liturgy. So the liturgical practices and the spirituality is, is lived and not just practiced. So our prayers are lived, not just practiced. Now this, this can be found, you know, explanations of this or um, writings of this and writings of monks who live this way can be found in Petra Blaher's works, um, Tarikh al Azmine, or the History of the Times. I'm not sure if that's, I, I highly doubt it's translated in English. If, if someone has it in English, I'm more than happy to get a copy of them. But uh, the History of Times, Petra Blaher writes about the spiritual formation of the church through monastic traditions. Now he emphasizes, as I have emphasized through the formation of the Maronite identity itself, that the liturgical practices could only be uh, sort of could only emerge through a communal and ecclesiastical nature focused on the celebration of liturgy. Now, <clears throat> for the Maronite monasticism, the early Maronite monasticism, and even today, today the Maronite, the, the Maronite church as a whole, you know, the celebration of the liturgy was a collective ecclesiastical action. So it Ecclesiastical means church, so it was a collective church action, so it could never be this private thing that occurs, you know, obscurely in some side altar, in some cathedral or something. No, no, no. The celebration of liturgy, all aspects of liturgy, was a communal, was an ecclesiastical affair, which meant there had to be a, a congregation a congregation to participate in. Now, Dwayhe writing this, you know, Dwayhe has, he's not, he's not, you know, he's quite smart, he's, you know, he's quite intellectual, he studied in Rome. So he's, he's alluding to things, you have to understand what he's alluding to. By saying this, he goes, he's alluding to the fact that the true Maronite hermits that emerged, the true Maronite, you know, hermetic way that emerged was a communal structure. Not today as we have this image of a hermit living on his own in seclusion. No, no, no. This hermit lived in a community of hermits in a community of ascetics. So we have, for example, in Asahaya, there's manuscripts that, in you know, each year, all the hermits would come out of the hermitages and they congregate in the mother the mother monastery in Asahaya. So there's this always, even though we're ascetic, even though we're separate, yet we're communal at the same time. So we start to see now this Maronite spirituality emerging of, of this communal church spirituality on the individual uh, spirituality of seclusion. So we have to always keep that in mind that our liturgical practices are one of congregation, not of, or not of uh, individualism. So one of unity, one of union with the community itself, not one of indiv individualism. And that's how, that's the, the basis of the ethno-religious identity of Maronites, that you know, the, the Maronite identity is a monastic identity because the people themselves were formed in this way because of the fact that they partook in all aspects of the liturgy. They were formed in this way because they partook in all hours of prayer, in all masses, in all liturgical practices with the monks. Um, now, <clears throat> the way he goes on to say that as you know, as obviously you know, the Eucharistic celebration requires a priest, a priesthood, and that meant in these communities of of, of spiritual children, the spiritual father inevitably has to be a priest. Or that means these, these hermits, these monks, were priests that catered to these spiritual children, that catered to these people coming to be formed at their hands. What's also more interesting now is that since these small communities have priests as their superiors. The superior of these superiors could only be hierarchically, hierarchically um, higher in church structure. That means the superiors of these superiors had to be bishops. So now we start to see formation of of a number of bishops, especially in Odisha and Anubin and the Sahaya, that area there, where bishops would be elevated by the patriarch in order to preside over these communities. So now we start to see this eastern sense emerge of of bishops presiding over monastic communities, not dioceses. Bishops presiding over monastic communities, not dioceses. So now the church hierarchy itself has become subordinate, so to speak, to the monastic way, to the monastic structure, to this monastic hierarchy. <coughs> hierarchy. Uh, what's unique that merge among these monastic practices that we don't really see in the West is concelebration. So we see in all our masses today, this is basically now uh, the monastic origins that we still see today, monastic influences we still see today in the Syriac tradition, is concelebration. Concelebration means more than one priest celebrating the mass at the same time. We have the celebrant and we have the concelebrants. 
Now, this once again puts emphasis on the communal nature of the Maronite church, the communal nature of the Maronite identity. This is this idea that the way he put forward that our church is an ecclesiastical church, an ecclesiastical liturgy, that the liturgy has to be a communal affair, not an individual affair. So we see that, till today, we still see that where we can have a vast number of concelebrants celebrating the Mass at the same time in communion with each other. So that's a monastic influence we still see today. This is basically this is basically important because this is the, the basis for the word God, this is the basis for the word Holy Valley. Because now we start to see all these communities coming together in the valley, according to Dwayne, and this is still according to the, the history of the times, that all these communal valley, these communal um, monastic communities come together roughly at the same time during, during the day for the prayers, you know, early in the morning for the prayers and for the masses. And their chants, their melodies as a community would echo throughout the entire valley, sanctifying it. And there are accounts by pilgrims, by Western pilgrims that pass, and Western missionaries that pass on this time, that say during the hours of prayer, you know, the smokes, the smoke of incense would fill the valley. Because you'd have hundreds of different hermitages, so hundreds of different monastic communities led by bishops, praying simultaneously, you know, sanctifying themselves, and by sanctifying themselves, by extension, sanctifying nature itself. So you'd have the echoes of bells, the echoes of prayers, the echoes of, of chants and melodies throughout the valley. And finally, this billowing smoke of incense from the hermitages, you know, the six times a day during the prayers, seven times a day during the prayers and the masses, this billowing smoke, you know, elevating the prayers, so to speak, to God himself. So we start to see now that in the monastic sense, the prayer not only conforms the person to the image of Christ, the image of God, but slowly starts to transform nature itself, conforming it, perfecting nature itself, sanctifying it, returning it to sort of this garden of Eden view. Because we have to understand that when the monks first came, you know, when, when the monks first fled Ophamia and, and Antioch and Syria, the valleys themselves are barren. You know, the valleys themselves are like empty cliffs. It, it's, it's, it's monastic life, it's monastic life of of all at the border of work and labor, oh, of work and prayer, sorry, prayer and work, that slowly brought life to these valleys, that slowly brought fertility to the valleys. So as, as prayer brought fertility and life to the monks, to these Maronite monks themselves, and over the millennia, you know, we have a lot of, you know, monastic saints, so we have a lot of fruit of this nourishment and of this life. At the same time, these monks brought life, nourishment, and fertility to the land that brought, you know, brought forth a lot of fruit and brought forth a lot of communities brought forth a lot of um, you know, life, so to speak, in this Maronite identity. Now, by, by understanding this, we come to see that nature itself, all the monks became a church. The valley itself became a church. They were in the church of the world, the church of nature. Uh, this valley, you know, we have to understand that there is monastic life in these cells. Not a, you know, we, to experience it fully, you actually have to go there and see it yourself. Uh, these these hermitages, these monasteries dotted in the valley, were, were as if they were within an amplifier, amplifying the spirituality, amplifying, you know, uh, the prayers. This allowed the monks, this allowed the communities, this allowed the laity themselves. It's important to understand, when I speak about monasticism, I include laity, because there was no separation between uh, between the people in the villages and the monks of the valley. They were one of the same, you know, Maronite identity. They were one of the same people. So... This, this, this amplification let everyone sort of delve deeper into this sense of meditation and contemplation, which eventually allowed them to come to know God in this most unique way that today we call the Maronite tradition and Maronite rite. <coughs> um, we see this through, you can see this through the divine office, you know, the hours of prayer that the Maronite monks, or the monks themselves, would practice and. Uh, in a communal way, the communities around them, the laity would practice with them. So the divine office, the, the, the significance of the divine office, for those of you who celebrate the divine office with us in, in the monastery, here or currently online, but online right now, we see that well, we can understand that this divine office allows us to come to know Christ by the entire year, come to know Christ in his completion. So it's not this one set prayer that's repeated, no, no, the, the, the Maronite monastic office is thousands of pages long, it's, it's, it's a number of books, you know, it's a series of prayers that introduce us to Christ, introduces the identity of Christ, and what's unique is that, 
that monks would call this office a school of theology. So the monastic prayers themselves became a school of theology where, you know, at the hand of hermits, at the hand of these superiors, at the hand of bishops, these young men would go and study from this school of theology, from the prayers themselves, to learn who Christ is, to learn what Christ is, to learn what spirituality is. So the monastic prayers now became a school of theology. That's why at the beginning there was no need for seminary, for, you know, seminaries or diocesan <coughs> and spiritual formation because the monastic prayers themselves formed a person understanding Christ, coming to know Christ in his unique way, in the most unique way that, that's, that's relevant to Maronite spirituality, that was relevant to these monks. <coughs> Um, and you know talking about origins now um, it's only fitting to say that these prayers would have been formed over thousands of years over millennia by by the monks themselves since the monks were the only ones who could write the monks were the only ones who could transcribe so these prayers would have been a gradual formation you know <clears throat> finding manuscripts in, in the valley finding manuscripts now Mariana manuscripts are rare but the manuscripts we find aren't complete manuscripts yet all the manuscripts we found thus far and translated and worked on give a complete image. So that sort of um, lens, you know, lens, lens weight, lens gravity to the idea that these prayers weren't given to the Maronites, these prayers weren't given to the monks, but these prayers slowly developed throughout the community, throughout the communities. And it was this development of prayers throughout the communities that allowed for this richness in spirituality, richness in theological understanding, richness in, in liturgical practice, richness in, in um, in anaphoras, in Eucharistic prayers, richness in our melodies. So it's this gradual development of the monastic prayers over the thousands of years, you know, being influenced by the separate hermits, being influenced by the separate ascetics, being influenced by, you know, these, these students who go to these schools in the monasteries and co-mingle with each other, mingle with each other, mix with each other. This is what allowed for this depth, this, this depth and richness to emerge in the Maronite church. Like, we have hundreds and hundreds of melodies hundreds not just the ones we not just the ones we hear in the divine office but hundreds of melodies we have i've said this before and i say it again we've had over 70 eucharistic prayers you know they developed somewhere they weren't given to us that's how you know this it's organic you know, this organic uh, development so we can start now to understand that over thousands of years the seclusion the monks you know put themselves in in these valleys the seclusion the maronites the laity put themselves with the monks in these valleys in these areas, it's allowed for this unique identity to naturally and um, naturally develop in an organic manner. So nothing was sort of given, nothing was put upon these Maronites, yet this identity slowly developed due to the natural limits of the environment, um, you know, the four, our forefathers were found in. So we start to see now the purely monastic development of, lead, of, of liturgical text, the purely monastic development of this spiritual identity according to Dwayhead, that emerged from the Church of the Valley, that emerged from the Church of Nature itself, where the communities would unite in prayer, that formed strong ties with deity, and that till today we see that we cannot have liturgical practice in the Maronite Church without having community there. So we cannot have a liturgical practice in the Maronite Church without intrinsically having a monastic influence of communal prayer, of congregation, of people, people coming together, you know, we leave everything outside and come together, becoming people of God, becoming Christ-like, conforming to Christ in our prayers. So, as Baker says, we cannot come, we cannot come to understand you know, the, 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 the Maronite identity, the Maronite liturgical practices, without understanding the school of theology that these hermits lived and taught. So that's that's important to understand that the schools of theology were taught through prayer and not through an actual academic. You know, there wasn't a curriculum, you know, the teachers here, there wasn't like a curriculum where each semester they'd sit. No, no, no. It was an annual, so it was an entire year of liturgical formation based on the prayers. You know, we'd go through the cycle of Christ, you know, the cycle of Christ's life, liturgical cycle, seasons of the year, conform the monks, conform the laity, conform all those who pray the seasons, pray the liturgical cycle to Christ himself. So eventually, and as I spoke last time, last week, or... Thursday, uh, eventually the Syriac idea of deification occurs, where in the cycle of, of prayers, we learn who Christ is, 
we learn this spirituality through this school of theology and we become deified, so we become mini Christs. We take on the image of Christ because we conform ourselves, we conform our minds, we physically and mentally become like Christ. Now, physically, uh, mentally is easily, easily understood how mentally we become like Christ, you know, and we're being conformed to, to this image of Christ through the present spirituality. But physically, now we have to come to the monastic uh, practices of the ascetics and the hermits and the monks. Now, there wasn't a, there wasn't just a liturgy. When I talk about now liturgy of word, of word, I don't mean liturgy of the word as the first part of mass. Liturgy of the word in, in this sense means the, the words we pray. So the monks didn't only have a liturgy of words; they didn't just have words to pray, but they practiced something something we can call the liturgy of union. Now the liturgy of union is when mind, body, soul, spirit, heart, everything a person has to offer is united to the words he, pray, he prays. So I'll repeat that once again. So liturgy of union is when you know, mind, body, soul, spirit, heart, um, strength, everything everything you have to offer is united to the words you pray. And that's that's uh, that's important in liturgy because we come to see this through all the movements and all the symbols we have in the church and everything we go through. And what's more and more important is through this idea of conforming oneself completely to the image of Christ, conforming oneself completely to spirituality, we start to have um, the emergence of, not, not only in the Syriac tradition, in all monastic traditions, we start to have the emergence of metanoia. So metanoia in Arabic called has is. So metanoia, it's, it's basically um, this constant process of coming back to Christ. This constant process of coming back to Christ, coming back to Christ. So, you know, I must decrease and he must increase, so to speak. In the Byzantinian East, you know, in the Byzantinian churches, we have the Jesus prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Constant repetition of this eventually conforms a monk to the image of Christ. In the Maronite church, this idea of metanoia developed in a physical sense through prostrations. Through the, we call it in Arabic, the boni, which comes from metanoia. The prostrations that we have in the Maronite church is unique, where our knees never touch the ground. I've spoken about this, you know, I've spoken about this and I, I this is one of the main, like, the main points about Mara spirituality that I personally enjoy. It, it's through this um, liturgy of union, you know, uniting body to prayer, body to words, that this idea of of the Syriac, of the, the Maronite church, of, of Saturday, the Maronite church of the waiting emerges. Because once again, we have to understand what the, the prostration is. In the prostration, he embodied the entirety, the entirety of this monastic, spirituality of awaiting this monastic spirituality of uniting themselves to Christ who went down into Sheol you know taking the fetal position the monk is reborn again with Christ when he is raised so this constant prayer you know, the, the Byzantinian of the Jesus prayer they call it the Jesus prayer yet yeah, the monks the monks of the Maronite tradition monks in the valleys took this metanoia to be a physical action uniting uniting themselves physically to their spirituality in order to conform themselves now that, that's very important because through that action itself, you know, made famous by the Maronite monks, the entire spirituality of the Maronite church developed, the entire understanding of, of Maronite spirituality developed and emerged. So now, once again, we, we start to see, it's like a piece of, you know, piece of material, any piece of material you see, if all the fibers are interwoven within each other to an extent you can't separate anything. So that's the, the white Maronite identity, the Maronite church, the liturgical practices. They're so interwoven with monastic influences that it's impossible for you to remove a monastic influence without compromising this material, without compromising this garment that we, you know, that if, if we take the Maronite church as a garment, you know, if we take the, Mar the, the monastic influence from it, we compromise its spirituality, we compromise its practices, we compromise the ethno-religious identity, we compromise the language itself, the Syriac, we compromise basically the development of the hierarchy so monasticism in this sense is vital for the Maronite identity because all aspects of the Maronite identity in the early development of the church were linked and only found within the monastic communities and the laity surrounding the monastic communities. So by saying this, the, the Maronite life becomes one. Now we start, now we're going to start saying the Maronite life because we've come to a point where we can't, we can't separate anymore monasticism from 
the laity, so the Maronite life. Okay? The Maronite life becomes a life of, of pure union with God, you know, of sanctifying all days, all actions of the day, all actions of, of our lives, by sanctifying them through conforming ourselves by prayer to the image of Christ, the image of God, the image of death and rebirth and resurrection. Now, these prayers took on a repetitive nature. So, <coughs> a repetitive nature. So, this is what Metanoi is, has is, so repetitive nature, so that it's ingrained within you know, the mesh of, of humanity. It's ingrained within our flesh, it's ingrained within our, in our minds, ingrained within us. So, we slowly start to move away from a liturgy of words and actions, purely words and actions, to a liturgy of union, a liturgy of conforming ourselves to the image of Christ, to the image of God, of undergoing this, you know, this the Syriac process of deification, as the Syriac fathers always spoke about it, deification or divinization depends on, on the translation you want to take. So we start to conform ourselves and become images of, of Christ in this world. So I began the talk by saying that the monks slowly conform themselves to become like angels. So now we can come to see how this is possible. It's through this liturgy of union, liturgy of conforming the souls to become like Christ, that they become continuously in the presence of Christ. In Syriac, they become Ayrod Lod Noyem, awake, and those who do not sleep, the watchers, they become like the angels, continuously in the presence of Christ, continuously in this metanoia, coming to Christ, continuously dying with Christ and resurrecting with him, entering into the mysteries of Christ through the cycle of the liturgical cycle of the year, and finally, you know, after all these centuries and millennia, and you know, blending communal life with lay life, with the laity, with monastic prayers, with church hierarchy, with the patriarchy, with bishops, with the feudal lords, with the princes, we have this Maronite identity that emerged that cannot be separated once again from an ethno-religious group. And from all this, we have the Maronite liturgical practices that emerged that could only be said to have their origins and their roots in the Maronite Church, which could only be said to have its origins and roots in the monks of the valley, which can then go back to the Famia and the monks of Beth Marun and the monastic founder of our church. And, you know, we should all be honoured to be unique in this way that you know that we're the only church to be named after a monk. You know, to the monastic founder of our church, Beth Marun, Saint Marun. So, by understanding all this, we come to the conclusion that. The monastic influences and development of monastic life, the unique monastic Maronite life, uh, led inevitably to the organic um, development. You know, based on the traditions that the, the monks of the family brought with them from Antioch, from the, the, the South Turkey, um, North Syria. Based on that, we can only say it's through the monastic influences in, in the valleys of Lebanon and the uh, and the Maronite strongholds of Lebanon that the liturgy and identity developed, being influenced and formed by the Maronite Church, and at the same time being influenced and formed by the monastic structures and the monastic practices and traditions that these monks brought with them and entrenched within us, and entrenched in the lands in Lebanon and in the Maronite identities and even in the language itself. So, um, you know, I can't repeat it more, I can't stress it more, that the Maronite Church is a monastic church. But the Maronite Church isn't just the monks and the priests, the nuns, the bishops and the patriarch. The Maronite Church is everyone. The Maronite Church is a ecclesiastical church, is a congregational church, it's a communal church. All of us partaking in the community, in the liturgy together, end up conforming to Christ eventually, hopefully, to we all hope for that, you know, we all hope for that in the end, to conform to Christ. And that's what's unique about the Maronite Church is we can no longer remove the laity from the church structure, and we cannot remove the church structure from the communal life of the laity. And in understanding this, it's only apparent that the monastic influences run deep in the Maronite identity, identity of the church, and that they even influence the communal life and the communities and the laity themselves. Um, like I said initially, I should have done this talk you know, around four weeks ago when I started the series on liturgy, so I just have an understanding of <coughs> of the origin of the, of the monastic influences because by understanding that, you know, a lot of the terms and a lot of ideas I used can slowly become 
relevant to all of us here because it's the, we we gain the sense that we're one. You know, the monks and the priests and the laity are one in the church, and because we're one, we're all in this you know journey together, and we can all practice the same thing, which is unique to us. We all practice the same thing, like you know, the divine office isn't done in seclusion. The divine office is done publicly for everyone to partake with us. And this goes back, you know, this always goes back to, you know, uh, back to back to Lebanon. You know, the, the people over there, even here, it's ingrained in them. Our monks, any monk, any Maronite monk is our monk. So yes, the Maronite identity is is quite interesting, really quite complex. Um, I'll end today a bit early. I'll end now. Um, if anyone has any any questions, any discussions. You're more than you're more than welcome to you know place them in the chat, or we'll put your arm up, put your hand up, and you can you can discuss things now. JC, thank you so much, Brother Leon. Um, in the um, introduction to Maronite Spirituality book, um, it mentions like the whole the whole thing is about how the first Maronites were most Maronite families, the first ones were pretty much monastic families. You know, the monastic church was much more monastic in his prayers. He'd gather around the table and say that it's a grace or the father working in the fields with his sons and they'll be praying off and stuff. So, so, so. Um, the thing I want to ask you is, what did the early monastic Maronite families pray in private? Was it the exact same prayers as the monks? Or were these adaptations and hymns that, like we see in the divine office that claim came later? that makes sense like, well, what is okay, um, how you pray all right, we have to understand that with the development of monasteries and the spread of monastic life across Lebanon there was no village you know there was no village of Mara people that wasn't centered around the monastery or church so that meant every time the monastery would ring its bell for prayers the village people would stop what they're doing and they join in that prayer Every time the monks would celebrate mass the village people would stop what they're doing and they'd celebrate mass they were called Shuraka so they, they were um, partners in the land, so the monastery would own most most of the traditionally Maronite villages. The monastery would have owned all the land, and the villagers would have been partners and worked the land. And you know, being partners in the monastery, they would have conformed their daily life to the prayer structure and the prayer regime and the prayer schedule of the monastery itself. So, by saying that, I'm you know, I'm not too sure if there's much study done on on the Maronite monastic household, but I I I hardly I you know. Be highly likely that their prayers would be the monastic prayers the monks would pray, since the entire community itself and village itself would have been centered around either the local church or the monastery of the area. So I'd, I'd say it would have been the monastic prayers or the monastic office, so to speak. Or things, you know, like the you know, the rosary and and obviously meditation, you know, in the gospel, you can't, you can't, in the Bible, you can't, you know, remove those. 